Hi, welcome back to another episode of Chris Dyer's Creative Friends, the super awesome podcast show where me, your artist friend Chris Dyer, talks to all his amazing creative friends. Today, I'm in Wynwood, Miami, and it's Basel Madness. There's art everywhere, and I'm stopping by at the Museum of Graffiti to talk to my good old friend, Near One. What to say about Mir? This guy's a legend from graffiti roots and amazing murals, interdimensional visionary art with a political content that touches the soul, exquisite technique, and a really deep individual that really inspires me and a whole community. So I'm really excited about this conversation. Enjoy! Blessings! Talks about passion between the women and a man. Chris Dyer and his creative friends. Darling, ooh, 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 Yo, Woo. what's up, brother? I'm doing great. Look yeah. at us in this fancy podcast studio. Yeah, man. We got uh, the ears we situation. Got the, got the echo chamber. chamber yeah, chamber. it feels yeah. very weird. It's very <laughs> unnatural for me. But uh, it was too noisy in your gallery. There are people I walking know. by. There's a hip hop music. There's a lot of activity. And then they had this professional setup here for us. So oh, yeah, man. Might as well use it. So where are we? We are in the mind. No, we're in Miami at the Museum of Graffiti. Yeah, tell me a little bit. At my show. This is Metaphysical Surrealism 2023, yo! Woo! Ah. Congrats. Tell me a little bit about this museum. It's so awesome. Oh, man. My man Ket and his girl Allison have put this thing together with Mayor 139 back in the days, and uh, they have basically created an institution for this uh, culture of vandals and street artists and... Um, you know, uh, hip hop in general. They've also opened up the Museum of Hip Hop next door, and they have a gallery in the back room here, which, you know, this year I'm their artist, they're repping, so. Yeah, it's so good. Oh, I, man. I, I yeah. love this place so much because, you know, hip hop and yeah. street art and all this, this, these cultures of the street yeah. are now like mainstream, and everybody's just grabbing it and doing their own version of it. But this museum kind of like holds down the foundation and the roots and the history right. of it so people know where it comes from. It's super important. Yeah, well, I mean, it's like that 1970s original crew that, that really started the train painting and vandalism and, uh, and also kind of rejigged the art movement in general because I always say that, you know, fine art was in a crisis in the 1970s because people were painting gray canvases with an orange dot right in the middle of it. Uh -huh. And that was making it to the museums and that was considered like intellectually mind blowing to people like this is, this is, you know, groundbreaking art. And, and I mean, the effort was minimal and the um, subject matter was void in a lot of ways for especially for an urban, you know, poor kids growing up on welfare or gangs and real life stuff. And you saw that and you're just like, really, half a million dollars for that? Like, it's such bullshit. I pee on a tree and I, you know, it looks yeah. better than that, you know, and it's, right. it's just like, you know, so it's a it's a strange it's a strange reality, but but graffiti art came in like a, like this like this tsunami of fresh energy and reality, and I think um, I always say that fine art became so bored of the people it was operating through, it left the the fine art world and it went to the streets and found the kids of the ghetto and reinvested its vigor into them, and I guess that's why we all have this culture now that you know it, it, it kind of like surfing, skating, um, punk rock, hip hop. Um, so even street art, uh, psychedelic arts resurgence, um, all of these art forms really got a lot of uh, roots in this, whether they were taggers or not, the, 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 the attitude and the willpower to be fresh and new, you know? Yeah. It's, it's so great. I tell, love it. Tell me about your involvement in graffiti which is your roots, right? Well, I, I grew up in Hollywood um, throughout the 70s, and um, 
I got to witness the original homeless crisis in California and LA and the degradation of our city and, you know, just like, you know, street corner vending machine pornography in your face when you're going to school as a young child and so much diverse, um, I don't know, consumerism, garbage that was just mindless and we were at war, we, you know, we were getting out of Vietnam and we were ruining Latin America and we were we we're still colonizing the world and getting oil and just ripping everyone off, but, but living it up and partying big, like big oil and you know, big bucks here. And I just think that like the, the certain generation of us start to get hip to politics at a young age because we're getting screwed. And um, that's why you see politics in my graffiti and in my fine art is because uh, kind of like that's how I got into graffiti in the first place was that angst that... that Wanting to do something about it. Yeah, you want to you want to react to it. You're, you, I mean, as a kid, you don't know how, you don't have the intellect, and so you're just angry, you know. And you, you want to break something or set something on fire or vandalize something or just be part of a movement that doesn't agree with that, you know. And yeah, yeah. So obviously, you wrote Mir. Yeah, and I wrote a lot of names, but people used to chase me down, beat me up, be like, that's my name, you can't have it, fool. Uh -huh. So I had to come up. You know, there was like I wrote Mace, I wrote Menace. A lot of M's, there was a lot of E's and A's in there, so uh, that's how my name formed. But I was like, oh my God, what am I, I need a name that no one will take from me anymore. Like, every time I come up with a name to take it, so I was like, all right, Mir, yeah, that's like this Sultan from Mars, like Mir the Emperor, Sultan from uh -huh. another world. Like, Sounds galactic. No one's going to mess with that name. And it's so funny, one of the co owners is Museum. Later on, I watched Style Wars, the movie, when I was a little kid. Uh -huh. And Mare, 139, the interviewer goes up to him and goes, are you Mir? Uh -huh. Back in the 70s, when yeah. he's a young kid, he's like, no, no, I'm not Mir, I'm Mare. Uh -huh. And so later on, I'm, I'm Mir, and, and, I, was, know, I, was and I meet this guy. And it's, I, it's just so cathartic. It's so weird. I was confused about that, too, because at one point, he's like, whoa, is Mir in Style Wars? No, like, no, that's crazy. I wish. <laughs> yeah, because that's like mega old school. So, yeah. um, I don't know if you still do graffiti, but graffiti developed into street art and street art developed into muralism. Mm. How would you differentiate graffiti, street art, and muralism? It looks the same to the normal person on the street when they look at the walls like, oh, look, honey, it's some graffiti. Or, but it seems like it comes from different intentions, different yeah. cultures, different development of yeah. um, something that was the root of graffiti. How do you see it? Well, uh, yeah, I think that graffiti was the raw, unfiltered version of all these art forms that have derived. Um, it was the one with the kids throwing their middle fingers in the air and yelling and, you know, and putting their name up where it wasn't meant to be because they, you know, they wanted to. You know, they were tired of being overlooked and stepped on. But um, I always kind of felt like street art was... Uh, like a carbon copy of it or a photograph of it that was put through a Xerox machine and then rendered through a computer and then output on a home printer uh -huh. to be glued to a wall. Uh -huh. You know, and it's I like was the like, product. it's a product and it's a, um, it's a process without the proper intentions, I don't feel. It's just, uh, it, was, it was focused strictly on you know, like a lot of graffiti writers just want it to be famous. They just want to put their name everywhere and get attention. They didn't really want to go against the system or they, they didn't have like this F the system type of vibe. They were more like, uh, I, I actually, I want to get fed. I want to get fed, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I think that street art is the manifestation of those parts of graffiti art. Oh, really? I want to you know, be famous? Yeah. It seems to me like that street art had a lot of political points of views, like with Shepard Ferry and even Banksy, they're trying to make a comment on society, mm. while when I look at graffiti, and this is just my perspective, it's yeah. like me, 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 my name, my name, my name, while street art was more like, oh, what the fuck's going on with the government? And well, yeah, no, yeah, that's interesting Not you that say one's that. better than the no, other, no. but just different perspectives. Well, yeah, I, you know, I guess, yeah, from some people's perspective, I can see that, you know. Um, if, if you grew up in Los Angeles in the 80s, 
you would you would you could possibly add more nuance to that perspective but mm -hmm. you know to grow up in different cities and different places we see things through the magazine through the internet through other people's interpretation of them and then they popularize and so i i don't know i i you know so the the ogs in my opinion were like really pushing a new level of fine art and an angst towards the system with an intellect of kind of encrypted gnosis. Like, I, I look to Doze, Doze Green, yeah, as them. one of the pioneers who brought knowledge of uh, metaphysics, of, of mysticism, of um, uh, occult knowledge, of conspiracy theories into his art. And uh, to me, that was just really great. I remember going up to Water the Bush, this, this hip hop nightclub in Los Angeles back in the late 80s that, you know, uh, I was just lucky to get in there. I was younger than 18. But Doze was the artist for that place. And um, he just kind of represented, you know, there was a hand, like PJ from West Coast would put up art that was like, uh, what was one of his pieces? It was a caveman of a bone in the nose, and it said something like uh, future primitive. Right. And to me, that language, future primitive, it, it took me on a journey. Street art to me, yeah, you know, you got your shepherds and Banksies. There's and, different kinds, so it's and, hard to well, generalize. You know, I think that the beginning part of street art was genuine, especially and, with and the Banksy. Also, was and it was also one. illegal at yeah, the beginning. Yeah, yeah. But what ended up happening was the art world and the street art world really teamed up. Mm. And uh, I don't know. I, now I, it's not really even street art. It's like oh muralism. Yeah. Oh like yeah. there's a, most of them don't even do illegal art. Well, I mean, muralism's kind of coming to its day, too, right now, I think. I think okay. we're now in, well, I think we've entered a new age. I think we're inter we've, we've already entered the age of the NFT. Mm -hmm. And we've already entered the age of um, artificial art now. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're really in artificial art age now. We've surpassed the mural. I mean, that's all been done for t 30 years now, you know? And generational movements are usually like a decade long. Like hip hop's greatest period was about a 10 year period. And then the next 10 years was some amazing stuff that came out, but it was all based off of that original first 10 years, you know? So everything, I always look at it like that. Like, you know, I always tell people, be part of it, but don't get into the circle, but know where the exit is and get out. Don't be part of the circle, because when the circle falls apart, your whole thing falls apart with it. Yeah. So I've always kind of moved on from these scenes. Like, I am mm -hmm. a graffiti artist. I still tag and still piece, right. but that's why I, I've gone off on my journey to find metaphysical surrealism for myself and kind of rebrand what I am now, and I'm sure in another 10 years I'll become something else again. That's why I'm the phoenix. You know, you got to set yourself on fire and rebirth every so often. Otherwise, you get old. You I know? love it, man. Yeah. Well, these <laughs> things don't stop being beautiful. Like, hip-hop will always be amazing. Oh. Graffiti will always be great. And Yo. illegal street art. And mur that these things don't have to die, but no, then maybe no, the no. next thing rises. So what's your point of view on NFTs and AI art? Um, well, I mean, you know, for instance, I'll just speak on AI first, because it's on my mind. Um, you know, a lot of people feel like, oh, man, it sucks, dude. Like, AI, it's going to like take the work away from me. And I don't like this because it's the person didn't do it. It's fake. And, mm. and, and I realize that AI is nothing more than an algorithm that's basically thinking off of everything we've input. Mm -hmm. It's not doing its own thinking. It's all of the thoughts we've put into this Internet through Google search and uploading and downloading for 25, 30 years, you know? So that's all AI is. But... At the same time, I look at it like, you know what? Screw it, man. I'm going to feed that thing my art when I get a chance. I haven't even messed with it yet. But when I get a chance, I'm just going to feed it my art yeah. and have a conversation with myself uh -huh. and see what it gives me back. And maybe if I like that enough, I'll turn that into some of my new painting. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I'm looking towards using it, but I'm not interested in just using it as it is. Yeah, like it, that's not going to be like your new kind of art. You're no. just going to use it as a mirror to learn about yeah, aspects of exactly, yourself that like you would mirror. Yeah, see a perspective of yourself you wouldn't have seen and be like, ooh, I didn't see that corner. And, and, it's also, and it's also a really interesting way to just better yourself. If, if, if we can all look at it like, damn, this is my competition. I got to get better. I got to fight harder. Like, 
that thing is gonna try and take me out. I'm like, I accept the challenge, yeah, you know you what I mean? Yeah, you feel like, you feel AI could one-up Mir One. Could well, could outdo Mir One in course. Mir One fashion. Of course, if I if I if I if I acquiesce or if I just like weaken out to that and accept it and worship it, sure. But I mean, my spirit, I ain't gonna do that. You know, I mean, I'm gonna look at it like, uh, you know, unless I wanna just get buried and forget about it. But if I wanna live, I mean, I, I have to, you know? But I guess the question is, is good art just technical ability or is that soul, that raw energy that comes through a human in whatever level of technicality that really is what touches uh, a viewer? Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh you see my work, I'm all about the subject matter, and that's number one. And then, I mean, yeah, there's a technical thing that well, I'm you, working on. You kill the technical aspect, well, but it, it would be nothing if you had nothing to say. Yeah, yeah, and, and I mean, I don't know, I guess that's kind of like being an autodidact. You know, I didn't really, I went to some art school, but that's not, I didn't graduate it, and that's not, I don't look to art school as my uh, blueprint to what I do. I, I, my life experience and friends and real life is what has um, kind of uh, inspired my art and, and, and just the conversation, you know, like to anything from politics to metaphysics to, you know, just, uh, just, just pure raw expression on, you know, how you feel about life and, and thinking and thoughts and philosophy is also interesting. And it's enough fuel for me to ride on for the rest of my life, I think, because it's always going to open up to something new and fascinating. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I'm not interested in painting for the couch, and um, and I'm not interested in that game either of the buddy club of perpetuating and, s and saving the fine art world. And let's get together and keep it going. I'm like, screw it, man. Go for yourself and make friends and build new <laughs> platforms, because. I don't know, I've never really had much support from the art world either, so it's kind of like... Yeah, I understand, but I think like the, the, the true artists are not like trying to fit into what the galleries think is cool, we're creating the culture yes. and the gallery just got to figure out that it's cool also, but if they don't figure it out, like, too bad, you know? Yeah, like, yeah. You still want to do it. Well, most of these galleries, it's sad to say, most galleries are not interested in pursuing what is fine art? They're more interesting in are you sellable? And mm. can, we, can we divide you up into portions that are digestible to our audience? And right. it's really focused on their audience. Like, are you, are you digestible by my people? And uh -huh. it's like... My collectors want this. Yeah, and it's like, no, do you, what the, what? <laughs> like, I was not born yesterday. I've been doing this stuff for a long time, you know? Like, <laughs> and they probably also want smaller paintings so you can sell more, more of them, not a giant painting that's so expensive and no one can buy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so, not very a good equation either. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's a weird reality. I mean, we don't have enough advocates in the fine art world that are teaching us um, uh, process. You know, uh, like... I don't know, just how to feel about it even. Like, yeah, you're going to paint this big old thing and it's going to be expensive because you worked on it for a year or two, but how are you going to think about it in context to these people and where's your conversation? There's not even any of that. Yeah. It's just like we're all just thrown together here. And so, I mean, it causes me to do that thinking. And I feel the more of that thinking I do and the more of it I apply, the further I end up from the official acceptable space. And I've kind of creating with you and many other people this alternative space and I like that and uh, it's just a very strange place to find myself here I am and I love it I resonate with your work so much because it's street but it's spiritual what did you call it before I, I call it visionary graffiti metaphysical or surrealism or? metaphysical oh. surrealism cool tell me about your style um well you know um, I've always been fascinated in metaphysics um, the higher thoughts um, mm -hmm. the, the, the perception, the perceptible realm that we are not necessarily physically equipped to interpret, but mm -hmm. our imagination can plug into this and our higher selves know this. And, you know, um, there are practices we can do to start to become aware of these subtleties. And, uh, that, that 
has always been kind of uh, an interest to me. My mother was from the 60s, a hippie. She was an artist. Uh, she's into her tarot cards and her astrology and mm -hmm. very much of a psychic and into healing. and Nice. You know, so, I mean, I got sent off to kindergarten in first grade with the idea that they were going to lie to me, and she told me this. Don't believe what they tell you. And so I was always skeptical of school and education and forced, you, you know. You were well prepared against the system. Well, I was prepared to think for myself, but she didn't prepare me for the reaction that these people would have getting, mm. you know, getting uh, held back or, you know, just whatever it is, just punished and... And that type of you know, so for them from punishments and all these kind of de detainings and just just getting in trouble for just trying to be free. Uh -huh. That's really where the roots of a lot of my art comes from. Is this like question of like why, man? I was born to be free. I wasn't born to be molded by anyone else's hands or thoughts. Why are we all going through this? You know, mm -hmm. like I don't want to like get in anyone's way or hurt anyone. I just want to figure it out for myself. But, you know, we live in that world, you know? It's like uh, the need to program us is is just some bizarre reality, and many people just accept it. Mm -hmm. So I think metaphysical surrealism derived from the understanding that there's a, there's this, there's this, like, well, okay. So, uh, you know, for instance, I think that we share spirit. We all do, you yeah. know, there is, there is, there's not spirits, there's spirit. And it's like, kind of like that space that exists between every particle that's atomic, that anything that we can identify, like there it is, like that's an atom, that's a quark, that's a this, that's a that. If it's identifiable and you zoom in on it, it's far away from anything else identical to itself. There's a lot of empty space there. And that empty space I look at is pure consciousness. That's mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, like if I go to give you a high five and we clap, that's only because the electromagnetic resistance of these points of identity are resisting going through each other. Uh -huh. But in reality, there's, there is no clap. There's no there bounce, is no space. Right? There is no bounce. No. There's, it is just, it's all the same thing. Like there's no separation. And I kind of liken that to the to the bad philosophy that people have come up with of we're living in a simulation. I don't believe we're living in a simulation, but I do believe that I am not what I think I am. And, uh -huh. you know, that we're not, like, we have these egos that have uh, physically manifested because of the geometry of ourselves. But, you know, it's like we're only separate so this whole thing can work. Right. But behind the scenes, there is no separation. Right. Simulation sounds so cold, sounds mechanical, sounds technological in our yeah. understanding of the Matrix and the movies that we've seen. But I think... It's like God has a computer up there. And right. <laughs> but I, I think it could also be God is just the pure oneness consciousness that is dreaming out physicality as a variety of options, seeing it itself in like a yeah. multitude and infinitude of... Uh, perspectives as to you know exist and be like whoa I can be this fucking neat suit and have a conversation and try to figure it neat out suit. <laughs> yeah but then you know according to some philosophies there's nothing behind me I can't see what's there it hasn't uploaded till I turn around and I'm like oh there it is and then the reality uploads yeah um, but really I don't know what's going on but I like your points of views so this is a spiritual perspective you have for your art but you come from the streets you come from hip-hop so you're combining something very grounded and rooted and urban with something very hippie and airy fairy which is what i love about your art and, well there's also a lot of there's also a lot of um science like i'm, I'm a big science geek mm -hmm. i always have been i'm into physics geology mm -hmm. astronomy cosmology theology all of these subjects fascinate me and I'm really fascinated with like the la turn of the last century when art and philosophy and science were all kind of combined as one subject matter. Mm -hmm. And that's what I've tried to do is, is bring that life back through what I'm doing and kind of marry these, these divorcees again. Mm, beautiful. Do you 
resonate with the movement of visionary art or psychedelic art? What's your opinion on it? Do you feel you're part of that movement or you're just doing your own thing? Do oh. you feel included? Do you feel like, you know, separate? Like, how I do mean, you feel about it? I mean, from the graffiti world, I feel like I'm one of the first psychedelic artists that mm -hmm. came out of the, the graffiti world because um, all my peers were gangsters uh -huh. in L.A. and I was one of the few that was wearing tie-dye shirts and dropping acid back in 1985, 86, 87. Uh -huh. Nice. And, uh, you know, um, luckily one of, my, one of my mentors, Skate One, who brought me into the early CBS crew, was, was, was kind of um, fond of that with me. We took trips up to San Francisco in the late 80s and uh, scored L and um, tripped and painted. And, you know, meanwhile, where other people were caught up in like a lifestyle of halftime doing drive-bys and scrapping on street corners and protecting neighborhoods and getting up and fighting over space to get up, I was doing the same. People were chasing me, trying to kill me for doing stuff too, but I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't interested in hurting anyone. I was just like absorbing. And um, so yeah, I feel very akin to the psychedelic scene, uh, the visionary scene. Um, yeah, you know, uh, these are, these are uh, some of the early roots. I think my very first show I did was we, uh, I don't know, that term visionary art was thrown around a lot. So, um, but, I, you know, uh, metaphysical surrealism for me was really, uh, it, it was just more like, you know, at some point in your life, you have to get real with yourself and figure out what are you, for a while at least, subject to change, but, you know, I guess my current vehicle, I used to be a graffiti writer. Mm -hmm. People are like, what are you? Are you an artist? Are you, no, I'm a graffiti writer. Uh -huh. You know, yeah, and that you know continued to evolve in the 2000s. I was like, I'm a psychedelic oil painter, uh -huh. and so now I feel like metaphysical surrealism is actually a, um, it's a, just a bigger conversation I can talk to people about. It's not so like abrupt, like I'm this and you're not. Yeah, it's like yeah, yeah. I'm a metaphysical surrealist, and I'm like, whoa, what the hell is that? And I'm uh -huh. like, well, let me come on, let's right. go. You because know? you've and, invented your own term, there's a little bit more looseness. The box not so fixed because sure. somebody else is defining it for you. Yeah. So like you could be like, oh, I do visionary art. It's like, well, I know what visionary art. Exactly. But, but it might be different from what's in your head. And I am a visionary artist, and I am mm -hmm. a psychedelic artist, and I am, and I am a rock and roll artist, and I am a hip hop artist, and I'm a punk rock artist, and yeah. I'm a street artist. It's all but one. I mean, <laughs> it is all one. It, but I mean, the biggest thing is, I am an alternative culture artist. Uh -huh. You know, I'm alternative to the standard model. So I hate the standard model. Yeah. <laughs> I don't hate it. I don't hate. It's uh, it's more like I I do not resonate with the standard model. Right. Well, you're you know? a rebel and you're going against yes. the current. It's more fun, man. <laughs> I am a rebel. You too, uh -oh. my friend. Hell yeah. Rebellion. Um you not know. not satanic rebellion. Uh Love rebellion. Create a current back home. Electromagnetic rebellion. Yes, I. So, in these perspectives, beliefs, and intentions of doing art that is spiritual based or metaphysical based past the physical realm, um, have you learned a lot through uh, entheogen medicine journeys? Is that been part of your process? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, uh, let's see. Well, I, I mentioned my mother earlier. She was way out. She was an artist, you know, grew up really poor in LA. We were on welfare my, most of my life until I was about 18. And my mother had, has had so many struggles. She lived a very hard life being my mom. You know, to be my mother meant that she had to sacrifice a lot. She could have been an artist and made it, but instead she wanted to just feed it all to me. <laughs> I'm so grateful to her, and um, there was just a lot of struggle, and um, shit, what was your question? Um, <laughs> psychedelic research. <laughs> yeah, and so she had already done all the research before she had me, and I just would get these great magical stories growing up that she would tell me about her experiences of tripping on light in the redwood forest or mm. meditating and 
resonating with Gnostic relatives from thousands of years ago and all this great stuff. And uh, she also had a deep interest in the ancient world. She taught me that when I was a little boy that there's nothing new under the sun. It's all cyclical. And we've been here many times before. We've actually been way more advanced than this. Mm. You know, that I, she used to tell me crazy stuff like, you know, a lot of what people think may be space aliens is just us coming back here from another advanced iteration of ourselves from a previous cataclysm or something that escaped it. Mm. Uh, you know, so, and I mean, she would introduce me to science. Um, on an, I used to go to the USC Science Center as a little boy and study up with oceanography and geology and mm. study how the earth works and volcanoes and what's inside of a lizard's stomach and, uh -huh. you know, how the brain functions and neurons. And I, I, I was so fascinated with this stuff at a young age. I just always imagined one day I'd learn how to draw all these things and talk about them. Uh -huh. Well, now I got there, but it's like now it's like there's just so many more layers of what there is to bring into that conversation now, too, you know. And um, yeah, so the psychedelic influence really started early on from my mother's experiences giving it to would me. You, would you do acid with your mom? Uh, you know, um, we did once. Uh, when I, when I got into the graffiti realm as a teenager, uh, my friends started coming over to my house, and my mom made a safe haven where she'd put purple towels over the lamps and put some Jimmy on, some Hendrix, and some Led Zeppelin, and, 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 and we would take acid, and she'd go in the kitchen, just cook and hang out and let us have the living room and just kind of safely laugh and cry and have a great old time trip on each other and mm. go out in my courtyard and walk around the neighborhood. But, we come home and be safe. And then, yeah, she eventually said, hey, give me some of that. And um, yeah, it was an interesting, it was an interesting childhood. It was very open and very uh, exploratory, adventurous. Good way to start that. Did you later move on to other more natural medicines, mushrooms, ayahuasca? Oh, yeah, man. Uh, I've never it? taken ayahuasca yet. Um, I've never really, uh, traveled deep into Mexico enough yet to find that and I've never really been to South America so but uh you know I've tons of mushrooms and I love mushrooms mushrooms is pretty much my favorite just because it's natural and easy and, and it you were telling me over lunch that you you'd also done DMT right yeah yeah a good friend of mine Milton who's out here somewhere gave me some killer DMT back in 2002 or 2001 I think and Wow, I mean, it really, uh, uh, you know, talk about getting put into a slingshot and checking out reality, speed of light. <laughs> what would you say you've learned from these journeys? Um, well, I think that I saw all of the, the layers of reality that I've been intellectually learning through science. I got to physically and emotionally and mentally experience on these substances. So I've always wanted to understand what is God? Who am I really? Like, who am I? I don't know. Some fucking guy running around trying to get art up and make enough money to put some food in my mouth, you know? And, but who am I and what are we doing here? So these questions, uh, I just have always wanted to take to the deeper level and, you know, um, yeah, I've seen I've seen this stuff on psychedelics. I, you know, I will say this though: a lot of people ask me, "Did you do this painting on psychedelics, or was psychedelics the influence of your art?" And I gotta say, you know, psychedelics is a very important part of the story, but it's only part of it. You know, it's like a book, and there's many pages in there, and some pages are beautifully written, and some pages are okay, and some pages are you just got all this stuff to go through. Yeah. And I feel like psychedelics is a good place for everyone to go, but if, it, if, if psychedelics is required for you to go further, then I think that it kind of lost its purpose. Yeah. I think meditation is way more powerful than psychedelics because... That it becomes a ghostwriter. 
Well, it, yeah, and it becomes a record that you've already played. You just flip mm -hmm. it over, and you're like, oh, I heard this tune already, though. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of repeats itself, and you start to realize the cycles within you that are repeating yourself. And it's like, oh, I've done this already. I want to... And I think the greatest journey, really, is meditation. Mm -hmm. um, Do you meditate a lot? I try to meditate every day. Mm -hmm. um, I love to take hot baths, because... <laughs> My back hurts and lifting <laughs> all this stuff all the time. I was like, oh, my back. So I'll take these hot baths and I will really get out of my mind. I'll be floating in there like I'm in some stasis pod. You ever seen um, oh, Altered what's, States? Altered States. Yeah. <laughs> ah, I grew up on that. So, you know, I'm always laying in my bath going there. I, uh, you know, uh, do you, um, I don't know if you've ever felt this. I, I, I have this strange feeling that's been coming over me the past, past few years, but I started remembering things like, memories that aren't mine, especially when I would travel. I'd be driving down a highway, I'm like, oh. Like a deja vu? Like, like a re-remembering like something? I know this landscape. Or like, like the moment comes back. I, I had it with people, but then this, this world has so much information, it's like, oh, maybe I saw your Instagram at some point, or I feel more, my mind is messy. Yeah. But I feel things and I, try to understand it. Sometimes mm -hmm. I feel the next uh, dimension, the spiritual dimension mm. seeping over and I can feel its soul, but it's not so visual. It's mm -hmm. just kind of like a feeling of like, ooh, here it comes and your consciousness. And I kind of uh, learned its textures through psychedelic journeys. And when I feel that, I'm like, oh, okay, I kind of recognize this, even though it's really, um, I don't know, I'm not very clear. <laughs> Well, I, I think that we're all susceptible to it because we're all composed of the same stuff. And so, uh, you know, a lot of people like talk about being psychic and all this stuff. And I, I'm kind of tired of that terminology because it comes with such a heavy like s ego. Sometimes people think they're so special. And I feel like we're all able to achieve this. And really, what what is it really? Is it psychic or what is it? And I'm like, that's... It's like it's a, remembering. It's, it's like a clear voyance, clear this, yeah, clear, clear that. It's it's a little bit more. I don't know. Could be ego, or also could be misunderstood, like the term visionary art, where sure. like we think what it is, or maybe it means something different for that person. Sure. I don't know. Yeah, that's very interesting. This this memory thing I've been digging into lately. I'll be driving across states. I go out looking at petroglyphs and camping for weeks on end and just trying to get away from society as far out as I can get from cell towers and things. And I just want to turn my phone off and take my clothes off and stand in nature and absorb like an antenna. You know, I want to pick up off. Is, what is out there? What am I missing? I want to know. And sometimes it's just the beauty and sometimes some things come through to me. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I get these memories, though, mm. and they're really interesting because they hit me like lightning, like an entire memory, like that quick. Mm. I don't know how I get the whole thing that quick because it's like it, then it's gone and I almost forget it then. And I I'm constantly trying to figure out how can I put it in a jar and save it, <laughs> uh -huh. you know, um, but these memories uh, are like of I could be a woman riding a horse across the plains, bringing grains to my family or you know, I could be a man in a tunnel digging in the darkness for God knows what, and I'm dirty and I'm hungry and I just want to make it back home. Wow. Or I'm on a carriage with an entire family moving through a plain of grass with horses pulling me. Or I'm a outlaw breaking into someone's house and there's a woman sleeping in there. And I don't, why am I breaking in here? Why do I remember this? Mm -hmm. So there's like a lot of weird freaking memories I have. And uh, that's been a real joy of mine lately is actually similar to the meditative process is really trying to get out of myself and allow the memories time to resonate. Cause it's like, there's a lot of noise. Like you said, it's crazy and it's hard to turn it off and see what is actually left after you turn it all off. Because right. there's stuff there, you know, and it's... it's, it's a Do you feel you're remembering past lives? Uh, you know, it's really interesting. Is it, a, is it my past life? Or are there all these past lives that are just stuck in the air that are waiting to be remembered for who's ever open enough to remember them? Mm. Or is it even some... I don't know. 
but uh, it's a, it's an exploration that I'm searching right now, mm. and I um, I really do want to understand that. That's, I guess that's one of my deeper fascinations right now in life is trying to figure out what is that. I, I run into people that know this, you uh -huh. know, that remember things. Yeah. I really like that opposed to someone being like, oh, I'm psychic. I I I, I can see your aura, or I yeah. can see who you were. A lot of times, that's a big turnoff, you know? I, I personally love psychics, yeah. and I've learned different levels, yeah. and I've learned to know who's doing it for real and who is the ego, like, oh, I got this power. They're, the, the ones who are for real, there's like, dude, this shit's haunted my life. It's made yes. it really difficult on me. Yes. And I'll tell you on the side, and those are the ones I trust, yeah. and those are the better ones because they've been yeah. doing the work to use their powers to bring a lot of important information to me at least. Man, and it could be help. a homeless person at a bus stop tells you the most profound shit that no one would ever tell you before. You know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. it's really amazing how it happens and I love that. I love that about life. I'm so open for any of that to come my way. Well, I, I question many times the homeless person, you know, are they crazy or they're just tapping into the other dimension that I can't tap into. So they actually have more visual power than me, but they're ungrounded on the physical plane that they're actually existing right now, making it look like they're quote unquote crazy. Yeah, uh, you know, I mean, granted, majority of them are freaking nuts. <laughs> yeah, so it's not like just being homeless suddenly mm -hmm. makes you a mystic. Yeah. <laughs> but it is amazing when you run into someone who mm -hmm. has so little or is just so disconnected from what we hold on to for security mm -hmm. and has all the confidence and security in the world and no ego and information that's valuable to you. That is some profound otherworldly stuff and uh, really grateful that there are souls still alive that are sharing that because yeah. um, it's far and few nowadays. Most people just want to run you over and keep going. Right. You're just in their way. <laughs> well, I love what you're doing with your paintings on this show. What's this show called? It seems like you brought a lot of information from the past yeah. where we were more advanced in many ways. It seems like this one painting with these giant blue beings, to me, I read them as Anunnaki yeah. channeling some kind of mystical energy and there's some gold digging at the same time a hundred thousand years ago mm. according to Drumbawa Melchizedek etc. Tell me more about that. I love that that world. Well um, I love I've always been fascinated in history um, and this idea that we're on a cyclical uh, nature here that things repeat themselves but they're never the same but there's a similar pattern that manifests and so to learn that pattern puts you one step ahead closer to you know being more intelligent basically and uh, they're telling me we got five minutes left I didn't okay. even get into politics nor nothing <laughs> atomic clock ticking Okay, well, anyways, let's finish this point. Let's tell them the show, and another day I'll pick your brain all about the politics of yeah, the world. Yeah, man. <laughs> well, real quick, I guess this show is also, I'm, I'm just bringing my metaphysical surrealism into the name of this show because I feel like uh, this, 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 this thing I'm working on right here is, is, a, is a new idea, so I wanted to call my show that to introduce this idea because it's, mm -hmm. it's not so much about the theme of the show, it's about the, uh, the reason of the show. Okay. Like, the re like what, instead of like, hey everyone, I do art, look at my art. It's like, no. why do I do art? The reason I do art is way more interesting than look at my art, I think. Right. What do you think you're saying in general? If we, that you got all these landscapes and you got, it, it seems very spiritual, metaphysical. Yeah. What would you say is the general message you're trying to give the viewer with your uh, collection you brought here? Uh, the general message is history. Those who do not understand history, life remains a mystery. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, no, that's, that's, that's typical. I don't know, I'm playing. What is the message of my show is that... Um, well, it's open for interpretation, really. I mean, okay. I'm, I'm really, I, I, I am bringing a convert. It's more of a conversation. The well, message of my show is I have a conversation for you, and it's going to be alternative to what you expected. 
Yeah, well, there's that middle piece, the green one with all the famous people that we yeah. could talk about for like an hour That alone. was two years of, uh, that was my um, psychotherapy for two years of the COVID lockdown, working yeah. out all those characters there. I okay. got to know them all very okay. well. Okay, We're, I'm not going to get into all the politics, but I want to make this, this, this question. Why is Martina, is her name Martina? Marina Asim? Abramovich. Abramovich. Why is she the center of the uh, Babylonian Illuminati head and not, say, Karl Schwab? Right. Well, Klaus Schwab is in there, yeah. but I used her because she's an artist. Mm. And the world is the way it is because of the way we believe. And art is, is a manifestation of what we believe. Mm -hmm. And so art is being used to mask over as an illusion to what reality is. And she's literally blocking out the sunlight. And mm -hmm. she's also, with her little child sacrificial lamb there, she's is that Bob Greta? To, yeah, Greta Thunberg. <laughs> She's blocking out um, one of her eyes' perspective, which mm -hmm. is narrowing her understanding too. And so it's very manipulative. And and, and uh, she's a dark witch. Um, mm. she, you know, her her whole art world is based in dark magic, where she thinks she's this very influential, powerful artist. But I mean, she's she doesn't have the she couldn't sculpt anything. She can't draw anything. She can't paint anything. I don't think she's a very good writer. She's a very good manipulator. She's a magician. She's creating an illusion, compelling you to give her your attention because she's mm -hmm. feeding on your energy like a vampire. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I just feel like, you know what, I'm going to start pointing these things out because I think there's something wrong with it. And I think there's something wrong with the art world that supports that kind of art opposed mm. to art that liberates and frees us. Right. Well, there's a lot of ills in the world, and once again, we could go on forever about yeah. it, but are you optimistic about the future? Are we going to like be the rebels that create the new world that's a positive, spiritual, or at least more balanced one? Well, I have a very strange one. I believe that the world is getting ready to experience the greatest cataclysm mm -hmm. that has happened in a very long time. I also believe that you cannot destroy energy. You can only change it. Mm -hmm. And so if the sun decides to flash fry the earth like a potato, it will only improve and upgrade our DNA when we return. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in a sense, it's, it's happened before and it'll happen again. And the fear of death is the biggest problem we all share mm. because fear is controlling us and making, the, making us have the decisions that we're having. If we didn't have fear, we'd be living in absolute abundance. It's, are are you afraid of death? <sighs> I'm afraid of suffering and I'm afraid of pain. But no, I'm not afraid of letting go of my life to continue. Well, I'm not afraid of letting go of my body so that I can continue my life elsewhere. Because mm -hmm. we're eternal. I, I mean, I'm convinced that I, uh, I believe my own understanding like i said that god is that space between anything identifiable and that's who you are and that's who i am and that's who we all are and that's literally what this microphone is and the air between the camera and us it's all one solid state of consciousness manifesting into these separate individual things that are kind of rever reverbing its own consciousness to understand itself through and so Death is really just transformation. It's, it's all the world leaders who have made us fear death and made it this bad thing and torture us over it and threaten us over it to get us to do their will and their bidding when it's the most nat it's just as natural as being born. I mean, I've heard that the ch before we're born that we're in a state of bliss and then suddenly we get confronted with claustrophobia, um, constriction, um, frustration, fear, anxiety, and we die. We no longer breathe the embryonic fluids. It's, we've been cut off from that, and we're no longer living on that source, and we are reborn again with a slap or a thing sucking the snot out of our nose, and we're forced into breathing oxygen for the first time, and we're reborn again. And that implants a great deal of fear in the human psyche. Mm that we work out for the rest of our lives. It scars wow. us all. That's wow. the original fear factor is birth. Mm. Coming through the womb is a fucking brutal experience for anyone. And I think that, you know, we just don't 
we don't deal with that enough. I mean, it's so perverted. We can't even talk about it, you right. know? But there's something very heavy going on there. Well, more I to hope, come. I hope we, uh, we can kill it in our lifetime. Yeah, Mir, man. Thank you so much. I'm sorry the conversation is uh, being cut short, but uh, may it's we have good, more in man. the future. I yes, love man. you, man. I oh, love you too, brother. And congratulations on such a great show. Thank it's, you, man. It's amazing. Uh, it's so Thanks inspiring. Thanks for coming out and sharing it with me. Yeah, hell yeah. All right. And to you guys, thank you so much for watching. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, share, etc. Much love and see you next time. Blessings! Woo! Yeah! All right. Next episode, the London Police. We could have made a lot more money doing something else in life, I'm sure. But we, we have been as happy as this. And, uh, mate, it's all about the happiness. It's all about the happiness, isn't it? If you can be happy, and at the same time, we still retrieve ambition. Uh-huh. Yet we're content. I mean, it, I could never have anything more in my life, and I'd be grateful for what I had yeah but that doesn't mean I don't want more and I'm not ambitious but you do it the right way do it with a happy heart and uh, you'll, you'll get there so please make sure to subscribe like comment and share big thanks and see you next episode peace